So I want to thank everyone for coming, first of all, and um, uh, welcome to the briefing. My name is Joel White. I'm the Executive Director of the uh, Health IT Now Coalition. We're a multi-stakeholder uh, advocacy alliance here in Washington, D.C. We represent uh, providers, employers, payers, and patient groups who came together to support incentives for adoption and use of health IT to help lower costs and improve health care. Um, we're really excited about uh, uh, today's event because um, it culminates about eight months of work, really about nine months of work. Uh, we started in partnership with the Center for Data Innovation. Um, I want to thank Josh New uh, for being here uh, down at the end. It always helps when you talk about innovation issues to have a guy named New uh, on the panel. Um, but we started, I think, about nine months ago. Uh, our, our original idea was to have a, a conference on genomics and to invite some of the leading experts there to talk about um, what's being done and what needs to be done. And so we spent about a third of the time talking about barriers and, and problems to, um, uh, to getting genomics and precision medicine more into the mainstream. We spent about two-thirds of the time talking about what needed to, to happen because we didn't want just another dog and pony show. We didn't want to just trot some people out and say, um, you know, here are the, the problems, let's get some good press hits. Um, what we said at that conference in December was, we are going to produce a white paper that uh, people who are policymakers can take a look at and use as they decide how to allocate resources um, and, and direct the activities of the federal government in uh, getting precision medicine into the mainstream. And so today we are releasing that white paper. Uh, it's available out front. It's um, online at healthitnow.org. And um, you know, just by way of background, um, that that paper I think um, uh, provides three solid recommendations, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but, but we're really excited to hear from our panel because I think in the past 15 years, since the first human genome was sequenced, we've seen a transformation uh, in this field. And um, part of that is because of um, the technology that actually sequences the genomes. And part of it is the technology that powers the tools that does something with that genome sequence. And uh, these tools are things like um, uh, data storage, uh, cloud computing, uh, they're programs and apps, they're super processors, they are uh, uh, smartphones and apps, uh, and they're electronic health records. Collectively, since the Health and the, the High Tech Act was enacted, um, which created incentives for electronic health record adoption, uh, industry and taxpayers have spent a combined $100 billion on the infrastructure to get these tools into provider offices. And the question is, at least in my mind, uh, what do we do with them, especially as we advance precision medicine initiatives? Um, because they hold the potential for, for truly revolutionizing medicine. <coughs> if we can get to the underlying causes at the genomic level of these diseases, we can literally cure disease. Now, um, what the President announced at his State of the Union address uh, earlier this year was an ambitious uh, project called the Precision Medicine Initiative. And he has uh, proposed in his budget a $215 million uh, package uh, funding that would go to NIH primarily, but also to the FDA and to the uh, Office of the National Coordinator. And it would focus initially, at least, on cancer. And um, they have been working since uh, through a series of public meetings and um, an advisory council. Uh, we participated in all those meetings. There's going to be one next week, actually, in Santa Clara uh, at one of our panelists' uh, headquarters. Um, and. Uh, uh, I think it's safe to say that they are trying to figure out uh, how, they, how they need to spend that money, what are the, the policy parameters around that funding that would best advance precision medicine. For its part, uh, the House has passed 21st Century Cures. Uh, that bill includes uh, a small provision on precision medicine that would require the FDA to provide some guidance to therapeutic uh, developers. But more importantly, it provides $8.75 billion over a five-year period to fund activities at the NIH. Not all for precision medicine, but it's a funding increase at the NIH. Uh, for their part, the House and Senate appropriators uh, are also providing uh, increased funding for the NIH and providing direction to the NIH. Um, like in the House uh, committee report, it specifically says that the NIH needs to leverage a public-private partnership. 
in order to make precision medicine and the funding that comes with it effective. Um, that's exciting because we have the private sector folks who are on the ground. They're doing this stuff today. This is not tomorrow's technology. This is literally the application of research and technology uh, on the ground today to help cure disease. And so that's why we're really excited. And so our paper highlights three primary things that we uh, think need to accompany uh, the funding that goes with building the infrastructure. Uh, first and foremost, um, because we've seen what happens when you adopt technology without the right uh, standard in place, we think anything associated with the Precision of Medicine Initiative ought to be interoperable. We need the standards in place to ensure um, that this uh, uh, research can be shared, that the data can flow freely uh, between the researchers, and that it can be accessed appropriately. And so we need standard vocabularies. We need the right transport protocols. We need data fields that work um, uh, to exchange the data and send it back and forth. Um, the second thing is that we really need to engage patients. And here we, we are suggesting that, that patients uh, be a part of the process. I think the administration has called them participants um, in, in the process of partners. And they ought to be partners. And there are things that we can do to incentivize their participation. Things like um, maybe discounts on their premiums or covering their transportation costs or the costs of their sequencing um, in order to encourage them to participate. And then the third thing, um, which has gotten some ink in the press lately, is I think we really need to rethink privacy law. One of the first bills I worked on in 1996 when I first came to the Hill as a staffer was HIPAA. Um, in 1996, uh, I didn't have a cell phone, I didn't have a pager. We had what was called the octopus in the office. Uh, there was a computer system that was a green screen and it was linked via, via a cord to a server and you kind of did your mail that way. No one had email, we all used faxes, um, and the biggest thing was getting printer ink for the fax. Sometimes we ran out of carbon paper. Um, that was the year in which the, the framework for HIPAA was built. And then in 2001, we had the regulations. And then we did a mild update in, um, in high tech, and then a subsequent regulation last year. Um, but the framework at a core <coughs> level hasn't changed. And I think if we think about genomic information being individually identifiable uh, at its core, that's what genomic information is, what genetic information is. We need to rethink our privacy structure, and so we made some recommendations uh, along those lines. So um, I'm going to shut up because these are the experts who are in the field doing this stuff. Um, I really want to thank our co-host on the Center for Data Innovation and Josh. I'm welcome you here for some of comments. And thank you all for being here. Morning. A big thanks to Joel. Uh, most of you guys have actually never heard that joke about my name before. Um, so we're the very happy to be here. We're the Center for Data Innovation. We are affiliated with the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Uh, we focus on the intersection of data, technology, and public policy. And I think of all the issues that we work on, uh, there's probably no sector where we're the issues of or the benefits of data-driven innovation are more impactful than in healthcare. Um, it's, it's literally about helping people not die. And I think genomics is an incredible development in, in, in recent years about how it's actually feasible or will be feasible in the, next, in the coming decade to, to have genetic data from every single person influence every healthcare decision made about that. That is, that is approaching the point of cost and time investments. Um, and I think that's a, a radical transformation of how healthcare works. And I think that will necessitate a whole a radical rethinking of the laws that regulate healthcare. Um, so, Joel set it up very nicely. I won't waste too much more time. Um, but if you're going to be tweeting, uh, please use the hashtag PMI for Precision Medicine Initiative. Uh, we'll be tweeting the back. We can share. It'll be great. Um, so, great, Joel, we'll start off. Thanks so much. Um, and before we get going, I want to thank uh, the folks who all made this happen. And so, uh, Oracle, Intel, and um, for, for really working on the paper and doing the, the lion's share. Many of our panelists also commented on the paper and made edits and additions that were incredibly helpful to us in, in helping the wrapper our arms around the issue and produce something that's uh, actionable, I think. So uh, with that, why don't we go down, we're going down the line, right? And um, uh, first, just 
you can introduce yourself and then uh, give us five to ten minutes. Whatever is more comfortable. Okay. Um, I can just sit here. So, um, you best. <laughs> My name is Anna Rose Byrne. I'm um, Vice President for Analytics and Information at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And um, as such, I'm leading the efforts for our analytics program um, that was initiated about three years ago um, with the idea of bringing data together and improving the access to our clinical as well as you know, research data shared with the greater community of um, UPMC as well as University of Pittsburgh to derive new knowledge for through analytics as well as to improve patient care and understand um, you know, our logistics at uh, the organization. Now when we started three years ago, it's, if you build a program like this, most of the money that you spend is on setting up the infrastructure, um, you know, going out, buying vendor solutions that are there that can help you in this huge endeavor. And then once you understand what you need, you understand um, how you uh, actually want to make it fit together to, to bring data in. So that doesn't mean that you, at, you know, at that point, when you make the decision, okay, we've got to buy all of this stuff, you already understand what actually is coming towards you. So the request was from our executives to bring clinical genomic and research data together, which that was, you know, for them, everything good, now go and do it. What you experience then is, well, considering the history of UPMC, we went out, we bought, hot, well, we acquired hospitals that had their own way of storing data. We, you know, we acquired different EHR systems that, you know, house data or organize data in a different way, and you got to bring this together on a, on a, you know, standardized combined infrastructure, which brought a big challenge for data standardization, for, um, uh, you know, it's like organizationally um, how to arrange uh, the company and the folks, and um, we. We now are in this in this process of bringing these different EHR systems, like Epic, Cerno, internally grown EHR systems, and combining them on one platform. The additional request from from our leadership was then, hey, now that we're going into this era of genomics, genetics, what can we do to integrate this data as well? Um, so but what we experienced on that side is that most of the genetics in the past or genomic initiatives in the past were all research driven. So you're, you're under this restriction of privacy laws and everybody that provided genomic you know, information made their own rules, their own standards, their own IOP um, you know, languages. So we're really... Um, getting into this into this world right now to how are we actually getting access to the data if we're under all of these regulatory um, you know requirements. So in addition to dealing with genomic data internally, University of Pittsburgh and UPMC were the largest contributor to the uh, National Institute cancer, so the NCI Institute for the TCGA data. So the interest from the research side as well as from our clinicians was there to even integrate that amount of data. So we went beyond clinical genomic data into this research realm to integrate now the, the TCGA NCI data into our, you know, one, you know, research or one um, data warehouse platform. So we spent probably the last two to two and a half years to really understand the norms and the standards that the NCI is putting out, and I think we have a pretty good handle now to, to bring in that big amount of data into our um, analytics platform. So what we're really, you know, what, you know, what we're facing right now is really the merge of clinical 
with clinical genomics, with research genomics data internally as well as from external um, sources that uh, that is quite a complex endeavor to, to go through. Now this is, this is the work that we're doing, but we also see that, you know, regulations from, like I said, from, you know, HIPAA, from, um, you know, from, from the, you know, the, the IRB regulations is a big factor to, to, <coughs> to, you know, to, to restrict us on how we make this data, you know, available to our community on one side the, the clinicians and on the other side the, the researchers. So this is this is really in a nutshell what we're doing at UPMC. I'm Toby Bloom. I'm the Deputy Scientific Director for Informatics for the New York Genome Center. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of the New York Genome Center, um, we were formed as a collaboration of 12 medical institutions in New York so that there would be one central genomics facility rather than having to build 12. Um, so we do a, a fairly significant amount of genome sequencing um, across cancer, across common diseases. Um, the thing I wanted to talk about today was some of the problems we're running into, particularly regulatory problems in the common in the complex and common disease realm. So, one of the big challenges right now that's coming up is how do how do we attack diseases like Alzheimer's, like asthma, um, Parkinson's, diabetes, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease? Um, they're they take a huge toll on patients, on families, and on the economy. But we call them complex diseases because they aren't caused by a variation in one gene in the genome. These things are caused by some combination of genomic variations, probably different ones in different patients. It's a sort of one from column A, two from column B kind of thing, and it causes a real statistical problem to find those the, the real underlying causes of those diseases to be able to, to um, do treatments. Just to give you one example, about a year ago, a paper came out, not from us, um, on diabetes um, that showed that there was actually one protective variant against diabetes. If you had all of the other risk factors, you had this one change in one gene, the other risk factors were different. It took 150,000 patients to statistically validate that finding. 150,000. Those were not all diabetes patients. They had to be diabetes patients and not diabetes patients. Patients with the variant, patients without the variant, patients with other combinations of variants. It's not easy to get together that many genomes. It's not cheap to get together that many genomes. It's critical that we be able to use the data we already have. And we, that means we need to be able to compare genomes across different diseases. And we need medical records because things like the age of onset of a disease, or the progression of the disease, or things like that, that is in detailed medical records only, are an important part of doing this whole problem. So let me just give you an example of, of the first of those problems. Almost every informed consent for a research project thus far, and it will change in the future, but up to now, has been for no more than one disease, maybe even only one study. Because in institutional reports, did not think we could adequately inform a patient about what might be done with their data in the future, so they didn't allow that language and informed consent. That means if I put all my genomes together, my tens of thousands of genomes, and I ask a simple question, how many patients in my database have this variant? I can't answer that. <coughs> review boards, at least some of them, say my patients can't be included in that question because they're only 
in consented for one disease, and that question isn't for that one disease. All I'm asking for is a number. If the number's, you know, over 100, there's no way you're identifying that patient. There's no risk to the patient. HIPAA would even allow it. But nobody knows what the informed consent means. And it's not like these patients said, don't do that. They were never given the opportunity to say yes. So this goes back to patient engagement. Where does the patient engagement end, and how do we keep them engaged? And how do we find that out? Right? But, but, but the idea that I can't ask for a count that isn't going to pose a risk to anybody is getting in the way of very simple answers like, is this variant really only showing up in people without, dis without diabetes and other diabetes risks or not? Okay. Um, so that's just, that's one example. Um, trying to connect the HIPAA data to that, the HIPAA cover data to that. Um, I'll, I think I'll leave that till, till the discussion at the end because I was asked to only talk for five minutes. Um, I could go on for an hour. Um, I, let me just end with saying that, um, no, let me give one more example. <laughs> Don't end yet. Um, these people have heard me talk for a lot longer about this. Um, the thousand genomes data, which was consented um, explicitly with language that said we will try to protect your privacy, but we can't guarantee it because you genomic the data. And most of those people are long dead anyway. Uh, a large number of those people, probably if we tried hard enough, all of them, could have been identified. Fifty of them were re-identified. The paper that was published did not say it. Um, did not identify them, obviously. They were identified using publicly available websites and obituaries from newspapers and the age of the patients, just the age, HIPAA compliant, that was published with the samples. That's all you needed, okay? I am guessing that the rules from HIPAA from 1996 or whenever it first was, that said these 18 things are the things that could be used to be identify people, that was in a different age, okay? HIP is now too strong and too weak. You can probably identify some very large number of people from de-identified medical records by looking at Facebook, okay? On the other hand, that also tells you that people aren't very concerned about those parts of their medical records. Don't have a good sense. I desperately need to know dates of visits. I need to know how long it is between visits. I need to know when symptoms changed. Right? Um, I, and, and, and I can't get that data without a lot of trouble, especially if the patient went to more than one medical center. Right? Because then I get into consents and consents and consents. Um, it's horrible. Um, I'll talk about it more later. I'm sorry, I went over my time. Um, thank you. Boy, someone stressed the five minute rule here. We're, we're okay, we got a little flexibility here. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't wanna... Yeah, no, it's, this is in jeopardy. Right, right. Not the I try to stay on time. I don't want to be the one who screws everything up. No, no, we're going to have a good discussion. We'll have a good discussion later about all my complaints. <laughs> but I, do, oh. I did want to say, I do believe in patient privacy. I do not believe in getting rid of all regulations and saying that that stuff isn't private. I just want the right regulations for protecting patients without getting in the way of things that don't matter. Okay, that's the third time I stopped. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Blake. <laughs> uh, Hi, I'm Tram Flynn. I'm uh, the Business Innovation Manager within Income Health and Life Sciences. And my role is to really interdisciplinary exploration tools that incubate solutions um, to solve the, the health and life science issues that we're looking at today. And in the area of precision medicine, um, Intel has this very bold goal of taking precision medicine into the mainstream all in a day by 2020. Right? As you can imagine, when a patient visits their clinician and they get sequenced, right? sequencing has been taken down to you have to do your secondary analysis, find your genetic regulatory pathways, do all that analysis. That'll take weeks. But when you come
try to get to looking at gene targeted therapies and then really starting treatments and awareness. That's going to take you months. <coughs> the things that are preventing that is, you know, compute and multiple data and all of that. So Intel is really trying to enable this through technologies. And as we look at what needs to be done to make precision medicine available, it's only two months. Data is being able to share the data, to use all the data. So some of the things that we are looking if you look at that, um, at how things are typically done when you're computing on data, when you send data to the computer, that's when the data sets are small. And we're talking about gigabytes of data, right? So, so our model is really about how you send the compute to the data, keep the data local at the institution, under local institutional control. The, part, the other part of that is the amount of analysis and processing with the community to not only optimize our hardware, but optimize the software, right? So that you can get orders of magnitude faster than the last. So you can ultimately get to predicting, you know, whatever pathways are involved on um, the awareness that you're trying. And then in terms of, of the data and the storage, right, we're really looking at technologies where we can have scalable databases, where you can do in database computation for all terms of data sharing, I, I think, and we're going to talk about this a lot, right, it's, it's a standard, right, it's interoperability, um, open APIs for these different applications and really <coughs> overrating the data. Um, and, and I think on the other side of that is, you know, this, this concept of, you know, we all have heard of patients like me, right? Well, physicians want to be able to do patients like mine. I have this patient with this specific with these variants, I've never seen this before. Has anybody else seen this? Right? And in order to do that, like you said, with the, the, the privacy and the, the issues, right? How can we enable clinicians to do that? Right? How do we change consent law legislation to enable clinicians to do this patients like mine type of work? And that's on the clinician side. But also on the research side, like you said, it's about having 50,000 um, patients in order to, to, to find that variant. It's, how do you increase statistical power by combining um, everybody's data sets to be able to do that? So those are the things that Intel is looking to do through enabling technologies. But we also recognize that technology is one thing, but it's an entire ecosystem that we really have to have to do, right? So that comes with the, the policies, the standards, and all that. So um, we're excited to be able to work that. Can I ask two quick follow-up questions? Sure. Just because uh, some may not know. Um, you said open APIs. Can you just define that? Um, application programming interfaces. So, if you look at a lot of the, not to knock any of the vendors here, right, but a lot of the, the applications that are created once you collect data in an application, the data stays stuck in there, right? So, if you have open APIs, that enables other applications to access. The idea behind liberating that data from proprietary uh, Good morning. I'm uh, Brian Wells. I'm Associate Vice President for Health Technology and Academic Computing at Penn Medicine. What that means is my team is there to enable precision medicine to happen at Penn Medicine, uh, to grease the wheels of science, so to speak, to make it very easy for the data and technology to be accessed and used to achieve our goals. Penn Medicine is the combination of the University of Pennsylvania Health System and the Perlman School of Medicine in, in Philadelphia. And uh, we have made precision medicine a key pillar in our strategic plan. We've made significant investments in people, sequencing technology, high performance computing technology, and the infrastructure to support this initiative. Um, some of the things we've done so far are to build the technologies to do sequencing at the point of care in the, in the area of pharmacogenetics. So we are now able to sequence the genome of a patient specifically about how they might um, metabolize a certain drug and then figure out what's the best drug for that patient based on their metabolism rate. We just I just came from a meeting the other day with a researcher that now has found a marker in the DNA for how patients, how fast they metabolize nicotine. And that controls whether they are addicted or not based on that metabolism rate. And so he's going to do a trial around, a random controlled trial around patients that have two different metabolism rates and are they better off with a Chantix pill or a 
so that's another example where we're using the DNA to predict pharmacogenetic type activities. Another big investment is our Center for Personalized Diagnostics. This is a CLIA certified lab process inside of Penn where we're sequencing the somatic DNA of the tumors that patients present as they come into Penn. We've sequenced over a thousand patients so far, and nearly 80% of those patients' treatment protocols have been revised based on the outcome of that sequencing process. All of that data, the research genetic data and the, and the clinical genetic data, is flowing into a large integrated data warehouse that we have built. We started building a clinical data warehouse almost eight years ago that has three million patients in it going back 10 years of integrated harmonized data mapped to national standards, and now we've linked it to the genetic data as well. So we have over 6,000 samples of sequence information that is linked to the phenotype information coming out of the health system. We put all that in a large integrated data warehouse, and we have de-identified that warehouse and made that available to any, anyone at Penn who would like to access that data. Only patients who consented for their data to be reused are in that, in that, uh, that data warehouse. But they don't need, uh, our researchers and clinicians do not need IRB approval, they can come in, work with my team, spend about a half an hour getting oriented to the tool, sign a data use agreement, and they can log on and run any, any query they want against the 10, 10 years of data for 3 million patients and the 6,000 plus genetic uh, sequences that we have. We, we actually have a contest right now. We're trying to stimulate use of the tool and see who can come up with the best discovery using just the data within this tool. We branded Penomics. We brand everything with Pen in the beginning. So, um, <laughs> That is, uh, that's, that's, we think it's taking off. It's a very exciting opportunity for us to, uh, to leverage all this technology. Um, one of the discoveries or one of the great benefits of this integration of all of our data in one place is that the genetic sequencing work done by one research team can be reused by another research team. For example, we have a cardiology researcher that has uh, consented about 5,000 plus patients into their blood bank, bio bank here at Penn, and he's sequencing their DNA. And he's storing that sequencing data in our large warehouse. Folks over in ophthalmology discovered that we had this warehouse, and they were able to use that same genetic sequencing data to discover patients at, in the Penn region that are African American with the genetic markers for glaucoma. They had to spend no money to resequence any DNA. They already reused what was already done. And I think we need this is what we need nationally. We need this kind of large database where everyone can contribute and then pull data back out and make discoveries without all the additional sequencing costs that go along with that. Um, so I think some of the challenges we face, I don't want to beat a dead horse, the consent is definitely a challenge. Um, semantic interoperability is a big challenge. Penn is growing, and as we merge with or acquire other health systems, we're going to have to map their data to our data and figure out how to map what they call a blood test to what we call a blood test. So we all have apples to apples technology in comparison to the data. Um, another big challenge for us is that there are no standards for moving genetic data around. So there have been standards for years about moving data from health system to health system or within a health system about clinical data. There are no genetic data movement standards or interface standards. And so it's very difficult to take detailed genetic data, interface it into an electronic medical record, and then use that genetic detailed data to trigger alerts and, and, uh, and warnings to the physician about what the best treatment might be for that patient based on their genetic we need those standards to be adopted. I know there's a conference going on in town this week. Hopefully they'll come out with some great discovery and we will begin to move forward on standards in that area. And then the last challenge is around reimbursement. It's difficult today for Penn to take our genetic profile sequencing process in the CLIA certified clinical environment and expand that from 40 genes to 100 genes because we don't think we will get reimbursed for that from our payers. So we need our, our government to help us get, work with the payers to identify what they can reimburse and how they can reimburse for the genetic testing. That will be a great source of additional scientific matter that we can use to make discoveries as we become to do more and more clinical sequencing with more and more patients that come to our house. So. All right, thank you, Michelle. Uh, so my name is Jonathan Sheldon. I lead healthcare globally uh, at Oracle. Um, we've been engaged in the precision medicine field now for over six years, working with many of the organizations on this panel. Um, and we have a platform that provides a single integrated view across clinical research, economic, financial, and operational data. Um, and a large chunk of our investment has gone into this genomic area. The platform's in production now, managing, as Ryan mentioned, millions of patients, and at the moment, tens of thousands of genomic tests. We're, we're getting towards that sort of 100,000, 200,000 mark that many organizations have set as their target. Um, but it's also clear to see that as in light of the Precision Medicine Initiative and 
million volunteers that are going to form the sort of core of that program, there's going to be some real big scalability challenges around the corner. Um, I think the panel's kind of touched on a couple of points um, that I want to sort of reiterate, but I think at a, at a higher level, what we're seeing in the field is really, you know, 10 years ago, this is a big research activity. So it was done by a lot of the leading academic medical centers, and the purpose was discovery, it was research. You wanted to try and better understand the molecular basis of, of disease. So you applied these technologies, you did a whole bunch of different kinds of analysis, um, and you published a scientific paper. The reality today, and if the Precision Medicine Initiative is going to achieve its full potential, we need to move, we still need to do that research for sure, but we need to translate these findings into clinical care. So it needs to impact the clinical care pathways and actually what the patient does in front of, what the doctor does in front of the patient. So, you know, it, the skills that are required to make that translation are very different from the skills that are required to discover new biomarkers. Um, you know, and a lot of those things are not, you know, they're not particularly exciting. They're the basics like scalability and security and auditability. Um, and a lot of those skills reside in the private sector. So it's, I think John touched on it earlier, I think it's absolutely critical that there's a um, tight links between the NIH and ONC and others, um, and stronger private partnerships um, that can sort of help ensure that we, we, we frame the, the, the problem correctly. Because it isn't just research now, we are actually trying to impact patients. And that's, that's really the change we've seen in the last two or three years. So, you know, very practically, interoperability is a, a big part of that that I think the panel's touched upon. Um, and it's really interesting to see that ONC put out a 10-year roadmap for interoperability and defined a core clinical data set. Uh, interestingly, there's, the genomics is not part of that core clinical data set that, that's been defined. Um, and it really should be, because in 10 years from now, it's hard to imagine that genomics won't perform a central pillar of the way we treat patients. So it needs to be in the standards that are, uh, that are being defined at the moment in terms of how we share that data. Um, I think we're going to come back in more detail about privacy, but just to make the, the point that no single organization has all the resources necessary to analyze this data, at however large. So sharing that data and you know, analysis across that network is, is incredibly important. Um, and from working on the ground on, on these kinds of projects, organizations are largely okay with sharing data, clinical data, through that de-identification process. But of course, genomics data is like the ultimate in identifiable data, and people don't want to put that data into any kind of environment to share. So we have, we have the Precision Medicine Initiative that's based around uh, mining this clinical and genomic data, but we don't have the framework that actually enables you to, to do that process, because no organization will put their genomic data into that environment fear of identifying the patients. So that has to be a, a fundamental priority, I think, going forward in terms of how we address privacy. Uh, and it's, it's complicated, right? It's not just the purpose, the state laws, uh, and it, it will take some time for sure. So I, I'll stop there, because there's a bunch of things I think, Joel, you want to put in. Yeah, thank you very much, John. Um, you flipped a coin, and Josh, you, you want to come around? Sure. Um, so, and some of you touched on, I guess, the, the biggest action issue or the most pressing challenge I think that you want to see in healthcare or changes in healthcare policy. Um, and it's pretty clear that, that the administration and Congress and the private sector all have really important to play collaborative uh, standard development in consideration of what the private sector needs and what researchers need. Regardless of who's doing it, um, what do you think the most important call to action is from a policy perspective, from a regulatory perspective, what have that affect your work personally, uh, Dr. Bloom? You said uh, earlier that you know, we need to use the data we already have, and I wrote it down in all caps, and I kind of want to get that tattoo. In my mind, that's one of the most pressing issues, because we, as much as, as more data would, would help us, we already have a lot. Um, it just can't be the most part. It, it serves a very, very specific purpose. So is that what you think is, is the most pressing issue, or is there something else that you think is you know, constrained? Uh, anybody else want to first? <laughs> Sorry, I have to think about it a little. Um, 
on the one hand, yes, I think we need to figure out how to be able to use the data we have. I don't have an answer to your question. Okay. Um, <coughs> we have all of these informed consents that say my data can be used for X. Actually, maybe I do have an answer. Um, and nobody ever asked them if it could be used for Y. And trying to find those people is a big expense. But maybe the answer is simply that we should let patients have access to all of their data or at least be able to say, yes, you can use my data for this and have that consent be sufficient to go to every institution and say, this patient consented, give me their data. Um, that, that might be the answer, to give patients more control. No, actually, just to get to the point, actually in our paper, we, we do recommend uh, giving patients to at least consider co-ownership of their health plan. You know, it is their data. They should be able to, to take it home or share it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I just uh, echo what Toby said there. I think it's the, the more ownership we give to the patient, um, I'm sure people are familiar with some of the new movements around flip the clinic and get my health data which basically provide tools to enable the patient to know what to ask of the provider and tools to help the provider understand what to provide back. Um, that is a, a powerful model, particularly in the light of the Precision Medicine Initiative, um, to enable the, a lot of the, the um, privacy concerns that are sadly uh, creating at, at, at the moment. So we do need to rethink, I think, that, that whole issue. Um, and it's, it, it does sort of beg the question then, what, what's the, is genomics and genetics data any different in that concern? Right? So if you're giving the patient access to their own, uh, to their own health record, is genomics just a part of that? And there are some nuances, I think, to, to work out there, because it's, first off, who actually requested the test? It may be the hospital, but it may be direct to the consumer as well, so it may not actually go to the hospital in the first place. And there are various sort of property rights and possession around the data when the hospital sort of burns it to, to, to disk. But it may not go to the hospital, so maybe it sits in the cloud, maybe it's in the, the diagnostics lab that actually carried out the test and never actually, uh, never actually uh, resides at the provider. And then, of course, there's a whole research piece of this as well, right? So who actually funds, if there's a research aspect of that, what's the ownership of the research team or the funding body? So there's things to work out, but I actually agree with Toby. I think the principle is the more co-ownership of the data to give the patient the easier the privacy concerns. Yeah, the one, I mean, the, the, the thing people have to remember about genomics is that your genome is self-identifying in the sense that it's unique to you, but it's like a fingerprint, okay? Somebody can't read your genome and know who you are. They have to have some piece of your genome from somewhere else to compare it to, to figure out who you are. And it's not exactly like that's around, okay? It's a concern for people for insurance, where a cheap blood test could be used to compare to public genomic databases, um, and maybe find somebody in your family with a risk factor for something and deny you insurance. Medical insurance, by law, can't be denied, but life insurance or disability. Um, and, and so we have to figure out what the real risks are. Um, and the difference between making genomic data available for medical research is different than making genetic, genomic data available publicly. And we have to remember that distinction um, and, and, and make it clear to patients which is which and what we can and can't protect and what the real risks are. Um, and find out what they can about. I don't know. I mean, I have friends with cancer, and what day they went to the doctor, what doctor they went to, what drug they're on, what dose they're on, what the last blood test results were, they're all up there in public, right? That's not what they're worried about. Um, I just want to Medical insurance, right? Medical insurance, right. 
the other types of insurance, right? Or for getting more in disease. And I think we need to close some loopholes within GMA to make sure that the dislocation um, or whatever other aspect that the body's going to do by using the GMA. So two for data use and one for closing loopholes. So if I had the, you know, my wish list to <coughs> true, it would be, I would uh, argue for more enforcement of semantic interoperability. What I mean by that is that uh, forcing everyone that exchanges healthcare data to map that data to national standards before it gets exchanged. And meaningful use stage two went partially there where they said Rx norm loink, which is for lab codes and SNOMED, would have to be provided with any data you submitted to the government for meaningful use stage two. A lot of, a lot of health providers and health systems have not been compliant with meaningful use stage two, but that makes it very difficult to exchange information. So if we're going to aggregate the data, the clinical data for a million patients, we're going to have to hire half a million people to manually map this data back and forth so that it all makes sense. For example, there are no standards for allergies in the industry today. So if I want to send what I'm, I'm allergic to to another health system, some human has to look at that and figure out what, what pen calls at these allergies and what Cleveland Clinic might call the same allergies and what words they use to describe that allergy and the reaction to that drug or that food in the item. Whatever. So I, you know, I've been in this business 35 years. We really haven't made any progress towards semantically being able to share clinical data between healthcare providers, or to put it all in one giant database and really analyze. It. So we could have all the best people in the world, but the implementation is bad. You know, it's it's the Tower of Babel once you bring it all together, and you, you can't analyze discrete data if it all doesn't map to a standard. Yeah, and, and I mean, the comment I made earlier about the ONC 10-year roadmap. I mean, struggling with interoperability for a long time. And now we're at the point where we're defining that minimum, that commitment to logical step, we're defining the minimum clinical data set that you want to actually exchange. And we all we can already see there's gaps in, in that based on the, the genomic data which is which is outside of that. Um, but it's 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 not just the creation of standards, right? It's actually the, the enforcement of those standards as well. And there are various Funding levers that can be applied to to drive that adoption. Yeah, and that goes hand in hand with what Brian says. I mean, the, one of one of the issues that we've seen within our organization, probably like to to the national, um, you know, linking data across organizations is to identify a patient. I mean, just just to identify one single patient. Is pretty tough because you know we're we're naming well we're not naming but there's spelling errors there's they're identified differently on the system you're using different identifiers one is social security number then we're making up our own identification and um, so just thinking about linking that data across institutions and we automatically have to go beyond our own institution to get to the power off. Um, you know, physician medicine, that identification of individuals is really, you know, needs to be a national regulation better than, you know, institutional understanding. So the, the issue of patient identification um, is kind of near your heart, but I'll let that more Joel. Well, let, let's stick with it because the paper actually uh, gets into that a little bit and makes the, another call for a uh, patient identifier, um, recognizing that. This area of Congress is the biggest barrier um, to, to establishing a uh, system to identify and match patients across records. Um, so assuming Congress isn't going to do anything anytime soon, how do we solve the identification problem? Well, I can tell you what's doing in New York, and it's not perfect, and it's not complete. Um, there's a health information exchange that, that, that collects Patient identifying information from all of the institutions that are willing to participate, which is essentially all the major hospitals and a large number of physician practices, um, and then assigns their own unique ID to that patient. It was initially intended for patients going to emergency rooms. So if you wound up in an emergency room and your next of kin said, yes, get all of your data, they could make one phone call to one place and they would find all of the patient records from all of the physicians and hospitals that are in New York. 
water to an extent of that right away. Okay. We're now using that capability to merge the medical records, the de-identified incomplete medical records, but it's a start, um, from six of the big hospitals and three of the physician networks. We already have five, over five million duplicated across New York patient records. Um, so, so five million patients um, for research use. With the ability to recontact all of them, I don't have any of their identities. It was, that database resides at the New York Genome Center. We're trying to figure out how to get the genomic data connected to it. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, but we do have five million. We expect it to probably be 10 million by the end of the year. There are three more hospitals that want to join, but we don't have the money to bring them in yet. Um, but the hospitals are responsible for translating all their data to a common format. Um, and yes, Lincoln, Snowman, and the others. Um, but they're responsible for doing their own translation, and we do as much checking on that as we can. But I'm sure there's lots of stuff that slips through and it's hard to correct that. Um, but it's it's a start. Yeah, the state of the art is, is probabilistic matching on pieces yes. of data with a human being or a team of human beings manually curating that match and trying to make it match. So what we're we right. So 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 what they're doing, and I am not involved in that part because it's a third party trusted broker that I'm not really supposed to work with. They have some algorithm. They don't match the patients manually. There's too many patients. They have some algorithm that takes into account name, social security number, date of birth, um, address, phone number, or any number of things, and weights them. Um, and how accurate it is, um, I think they're claiming something like 90%, but they're not claiming 100%. Yeah. And yes, when we get an update every three months, there's sometimes things that say, oh, we matched these two patients before. We don't think they're the same anymore. Can you, can you split them and match this one with this other set of patients instead? Um, yeah, it is probabilistic, but we're hoping it's reasonably accurate. I mean, I've got to put this in to do with technology. We've, we've just gone live in Brazil without API with 200 million patients doing exactly as what we described, deduplication. And mm -hmm. We're stopping them now reissuing um, new identifiers. I think they were, they were wrongly issuing about 50,000 identifiers per month rather than going to check to a central repository of identifiers. So it's not a, it's not a technology issue. I think, you, as you rightly pointed out, it's a... One of, well, one of the interesting one of the interesting things that's happened with ours, and like I said, it's five million, not two hundred million. We do have the unique identifiers. The hospitals are now requiring that for any researcher who comes in and wants to use the data for a study where they may be combining it with identifying data, we have to give out a different identifier. They can't use the same patient. So we've got these collections of matched patient identifiers. You know, and in, in the world of health information exchange, if you get the number wrong, you can put someone else's yes. data on a different page. If you do that yes, in a real-time clinical Yes, and if you do that, you're in happen. really, right, yeah. mistakes happen. We need, yes. a, we need a number. Just out of, out of curiosity, right. before that system, were they okay with sharing the full social security number? Because a lot, I mean, a lot of records use that, but it's never intended for medical records. But, right. like, but it is, yeah. I mean, but this, the, the, the exchange that does ours does take social security numbers when they're given social security numbers. Right? Typos and social security numbers are as much of a problem as anything else, but but yes, it's a reasonable <coughs> partial identifier. Probably not the one we want to use as a national medical So can I do a, a follow-up here? Um, so, uh, Brian, you did a really good job talking about um, over the 10-year period uh, how you're taking that, that data that you have available, you're identifying things like for this uh, specific gene, uh, this person is more likely to respond to a pill or to the patch, right, and then uh, getting that to, to, to translate to the, the bedside, right? Um, so, so what has changed over that 10-year period, and this is for all the researchers, um, from a technology standpoint, what <coughs> tools do you have available to you now 
that, that's allowing you to make those linkages. And where do you see it going in terms of, like, we're going to now put a lot of uh, money and effort and time into precision medicine, right? And some, some people I've heard say this is the shiny key. We're going to start chasing that thing now, right? But, but tell me, and tell, tell everyone here, <coughs> what's that practical application? What's it going to mean in the lives of our patients? And maybe for all the researchers here, Brian, start with you. So, you know, tens of strong believer in translation of medicine. Translation of medicine for us means preventative medicine. So in the clinical, or in the research setting, it's doing those GWAS association studies or those large patient panels or, or research panels where you can identify variants and clinical can you, is, is this variant in, the, in their DNA something you can actually act upon? And is there proof that that is true from many research studies? And so as those variants get identified and published and, and, the, and the research community is comfortable with that variant being a predictor of some outcome, then we will take that and bring that into the clinical setting. The first one we did was the uh, sequencing for a CYP219 uh, genetic marker, which is for pitagrel or chrysoprol. So it's, it's metabolism metabolizing of uh, blood clotting agents. And so we actually, the technology part of it is that we found a company that did a point of care genetic sequencing process. So we took a sample from the patient in the cath lab, we put it in this machine about the size of a you know, toaster, and in a little while out comes the result. And then you can decide whether you prescribe critical or prasigral, you know, depending on how they metabolize. So, that, so this is a company that has said, this marker is so reliable that we're going to turn it into a point of care testing device. So that's an example of how we've gone from someone in a research team figuring it out to all the way down to the client in the care setting. In the nicotine example, a research team has worked for I mean, years and years and years trying to figure out whether this one DNA, this, this one protein, was a predictor of nicotine metabolism. And now they're fairly confident after years of studies and tests and random controlled trials that this is reliable. Now they want to put it into our electronic medical record and build a best practice alert that pops up in the point of care and has a hard stop for the patient, for the provider that says, all right, this patient has this marker, give them the get prescribed Chantix or prescribed patch. And then we'll test that process and then we'll check outcomes and see if they actually will follow that patient for six months, nine months, a year and see what their quick, you know, their you know, cessation rate is in smoking. And if they're still, if the patch worked for them, then that Talk to me about like four years ago we didn't have iPads. What's changed in the, in the, in the computing sense that's enabled you to do that? It's the, it's the cost of sequencing, it's the cost of doing the analysis and the alignment after you do the sequencing, it's the ability to be, have the electronic medical records do this kind of pop up technology, and the adoption of medical records. So we're very fortunate, and every clinician uses one electronic health record. We're all using the same system. It's very easy for me to deploy technology on one platform. And our other doesn't support to have that one. But we, you know, so that, that's a big change that a lot of organizations are still fighting their way through to get to that single platform. I do think Brian made a real key point actually about building the business case and implement some of these genetic tests. So we're increasingly now starting to see people build out a case for the impact of that genetic test. So. It's fine to do all the great research and come with a new biomarker, but you have to, in order to truly implement that test in a clinical care setting, you have to look at what it's going to cost. Um, and that sort of you know, level of um, costing, cost accounting is, is critical. And there are studies now that are starting to be produced that look at the impact of, of genomics on care. It's, it's, it's startling. I and mean, the clinical utility is, is startling. But you do have to follow it's patients for months and years to see if the outcome really justifies the cost. But, but for a while, I think those numbers may be misleading and I'm concerned about them. I mean, I do think it's going to bring down costs substantially. Um, the, the thing I'm worried about, which is a little off the topic we were talking about, but, but I think relevant here is Right. This is a case where they found, well, the gene was found a long time ago. It took many years to find the drug to treat it. We've now got a drug that, that can help kids who had no future live normal lives, normal productive lives. But the drug is expensive, and drug companies are, are pushing that. Um, and, and, you know, so now you're balancing 
what's the productivity of a full life and and having a job and contributing and paying taxes and whatever against the cost of this drug per year. But what people forget about, and, and seriously, I mean, there's one state that's refusing to provide the drug. Um, but what people are forgetting about, what? Um, but the thing that people aren't thinking about is this is step one and we're only in the game. The next step is to find the cure. And then it's a one-time thing and you're not paying a whole lot of money every year for the drug. But we have to do it in stages. Cancer is likely to become treatable before it's curable. And, and so there's lots and lots of work going on in that area now. I mean, because we started as a collaboration with Bill Hospital, we're, we're really connected to the clinical stuff too. Um, you know, we're trying to figure out things like now, like if if genomic testing can can help us better pick, and it's a research study, so we don't have full answers yet, but better pick combinations <coughs> of drugs for glioblastoma, um, brain cancer, brain cancer because there's there's one chemotherapy. Right now, particularly for cancer, but it's also happening with cystic fibrosis, we're finding that there are drugs that are very likely to work because of the genetic variants of one, but they aren't approved for that disease. They're approved for a different kind of cancer, not this cancer. Or in cystic fibrosis, there's probably a hundred different variants, and 
Galatico's only um, approved for a few of them, and at some point it's not worth it for the pharmaceutical companies to go do more clinical trials for rarer and rarer variants. You know, if they've got already got an approval for a common cancer, why do a clinical trial for a rare cancer? And that leaves patients with drugs that could save their lives with no insurance. I don't know how we fix that, but the idea that drugs are tied to a disease rather than a genomic <coughs> marker or markers genotype or whatever category you want to put it in is something that I think over time is going to have to change. Because I don't genomics is going to change. The more we have diagnostic tests, the more it's going to depend on on the tests and the disease. I think it is already, right? Like twenty percent of the FDA approvals last year were for uh, precision medicine. Well, they were approvals only for patients with specific biomarkers who had a specific disease. So it targets, it makes it easier to do the clinical trial and targets a smaller number of patients because only the patients with this disease and this marker get the drug. But it doesn't expand it to people with this marker and a different disease. And in, particularly in cancer, that matters a lot. And, and I don't want to suggest that if the drug works on this marker in this cancer, it will automatically work on the same marker in other cancers. That is not true, okay? But, but there needs to be an easier way to get to those other things that do work um, without, without the full... I think what is, what's encouraging, actually, is since you've looked at the way part of uh, adopting biomarkers in their trial design, AstraZeneca put out a paper about a year ago that did an analysis of their entire pipeline. Uh, and it depends a little bit how you define a personalized medicine strategy, but their figure was nearly 80% now have some form of personalized biomarker that, that they're using to design the trial. So we're going to see a lot more of these kind of companion diagnostics coming to the market with the drugs. So I completely agree it's not going to be about the disease, it's going to be about the test. Right. And so um, we did want to leave some time for, for audience Q&A. I just want to touch on, so we touched on, real quick, um, so we, for you. we touched on the two of the three main areas. We touched on interoperability and data sharing. We touched on uh, the impacts of the project as well. The third area that we think is really important is the engaging patient. Because you know, all of us in the know, of course, we know the benefits of sharing data, but the average person probably won't. Um, and every time data collection in, in kind of any sector gets up, the, the opt-in versus the opt-out whether you collect this information by default or you only collect it after explicit consent that, that the user or the patient proactively says, use my data. Um, but then we see the Precision Medicine Initiative is it collect once and use forever. It, it's a, uh, it removes a lot of the, the, the obstacles and the, the burdens of notification and approval and all that stuff. Um, so I guess, first of all, what do you think is the best option? Should it be an opt-in or opt-out approach? And also, when regardless, do, do patients in your group really know what they're agreeing to? Is there, are there mechanisms so I'll start. I, I think it has to be opt-in because the difficulty of doing opt-in is exorbitant to the health care provider. You have to have people at every place that a patient is going to be asked if you want to be in or out to explain what that means. Just reading a document isn't enough. So we've been trying to move towards kind of you opt out with your feet. If you don't want to be in part of this research initiative, don't come here. Some Sometimes medical centers like Penn take that approach. <coughs> at Penn, we are not yet there. The IRB at Penn is still not comfortable with an opt-out approach, so therefore it's opt-in. And we have we have people sitting in our labs at the blood collection stations, going seat to seat, asking people if they want to contribute to the biobank. And it's a process. And it's, well, one thing we've learned is that if one person in the room says no, everybody else starts saying no. <laughs> but if one if everybody's saying yes, the yeses just keep rolling along in, in the waiting area. So, and, there, and it's difficult to explain to patients. So, but, I, but I don't think, and then the other problem is as a technologist, we have to track opt-in. We have to all, all these flags in all of our systems for what the patient's decision is. We have to do have an opt-out as well, but it's a much smaller percentage potentially of patients that don't want to be part of the research. And that means when you're sharing data, you have to add to every query and every report this checking of this flag that this patient can and can't see the data. This 
provider can't see this patient's data. It gets extremely complicated to manage. So I think opt out's the way to go. I know there are issues and it's difficult to get there, but if we're going to get to a million patients, it's, it's going to be, you can't do opt out. Not that that consent is not computable, right? So yeah. you're not capturing it in the way where you can actually. You so have to put all kinds of flags in. Can, you know, you can consent for your part of the study, but then can we right to recontact? Is that another consent? And, Right to reuse, is that another consent? Well, you have to anticipate any other future people right. that are trying to do it. Right. There are two hospitals in New York that are trying a different approach. And I don't think it's clear yet how well it's going to work. They're asking every patient when they show up the first time to sign a form saying that their medical records can be used for all medical research and that any discarded tissue can be used for any purpose, including genomic testing. We, we want to do the and same thing. So that's it's an opt-in, but it's a it's an easier <laughs> sort of more general opt-in. It's not a walking around the waiting room. It's a you know probably the first time you see the doctor or the next time you see your doctor. But they're talking about gee, when they give you that HIPAA form, they give you this other thing. Um, and so the fear we have is that patients are asking. When the patient says, what does this line mean, the check-in person know. has no idea. Right. You have to have somebody there who can explain. And that means you um, need to have lots of somebody's around to explain. Because we have 90 locations. Right. So. Did you want to weigh in before you go to the audience? Do, do we need a national consent? You bet. Common, oh, yeah. with consistent language and nationally adopted language. Absolutely. And there's plenty of good examples. This idea that you would have a opt-in only, I mean, doesn't that assume that you are entirely confident of the privacy um, protections that you're offering people? If you are saying to people, well, it's just too complicated to do opt-in, you have to do opt-out, but don't worry about it because, you know, I mean, there are misuses of data by the government, potentially, but also this you know, pestering misuses of data that you encounter every day. And so um, I guess I'm just wondering, like, how do you coordinate <coughs> your effort to, like, push the science forward with really having the, the privacy laws in a place that everyone can be sort of comfortable with? So we apply the same protections we apply to normal data, <coughs> clinical data, HIPAA compliant data. We, we continue to do that. We're all, we all are processing lots and lots of data today and there are breaches and things happen and we say to patients in the consent, here's the risks that you're, you know, if you're opting out or in, I mean, these are the risks you're facing. Um, and we try to make that very clear to them. And, and we, we do everything within our power to prevent, prevent that from happening. Uh, John, who are you? Okay, sorry, I, I think I may have misunderstood something about the nature of sequencing not being scientist. Trying to sort of cause the things, and you're saying you're not getting reimbursed effectively. And you mentioned the handles and whatnot. I thought we were going to a retail environment where two, three, and eight grams of the drug store for, you know, you know what I mean? So, I, what am I missing when understanding? You know, there's obviously sequencing, another sequencing, right. and I'm misunderstanding the cost of, of the various tests that you're talking about. So, maybe you can so the sequencing I'm talking about in, in the clinical flow. In the CLIA certified lab flow is, is somatic sequencing. So it's very targeted. Four genes sequenced based on a sample that we took. We biopsied your tumor and we sequenced that DNA of your tumor. That's where we're trying to get reimbursement. We can get reimbursement for 40 genes, but when we want to go to 100, we start getting pushback because we haven't risen to science to prove that getting the extra 60 is, has that return on investment. So, okay. So when I come to you with my 23 me report, that doesn't give you... It doesn't help me with your tumor, okay. number one. And then, you know, 23 me doesn't expose everything that they've sequenced. And they didn't necessarily do the full genome either. And then who knows what equipment they used. And they did it a year ago, and the technology's changed. And the depth of the reads is not accurate, accurate enough. On and on and on. Policy makers that you would say consider the MMPMI and other related measures. Uh, the, the report mentions the uh, meaningful 
use rule of the high tech thought uh, uh, EHR to practitioners like in the centuries. It also mentions it was watered down because of doctors supposed to be a literacy. Uh, at a June hearing of the Senate Health Committee, Mara Alexander, the committee chair, said that the medical use rule was effective because it hadn't gone down health care costs. At a uh, conference I was at on Monday with another Mr. White from OMC, he said, everyone's always asking me about the $30 billion for the whole use rule. And uh, private partners, potential partners, would be better to implement these changes that complain that the government does not opt in, they're worried about the effect on them. With all of that uh, along with the background, uh, if the meaningful use of more than thirty billion dollars is a stigma, how do you address it? <coughs> One of the things that the point that we try and make in the paper is that um, we almost got it backwards in the meaning we said um, we're going to provide incentives for people to adopt. We're not going to define the standards around interoperability for the things that they're adopting. So we didn't do the semantic uh, interoperability, the syntactic interoperability, the context in which the data is being shared, the right transport protocols to uh, send, receive, and query data. Um, we have an opportunity with precision medicine to establish those, those standards before we build it. And so we, we, we ought to be able to learn from our mistakes, right? Get this one right, and there's so much at stake with precision medicine. I hope we do get it right. And also, just to build up that real quick, of course, the cost of healthcare is an enormous concern. So, you know, what to do is the okay, the U.S. spent so much more per person than any other developed country in the world. But I don't think that's the only metric of success. And of course, the EHR has a <coughs> problem, but it's not just making it less expensive that is the most concern, it's making it uh, shorting the, the time of communication, reducing patient misidentification, improving healthcare outcomes. I'm not sure if EHR has been. But I think just looking at the cost as the only indicator of success is not necessarily um, the most nuanced. Hi, this is Fanny from Oracle. Um, I have a question for the panelists. And if you are about to meet with uh, Dr. Francis Poland, and what would you share with him as the most important factor to ensure the million patient cohort precision medicine program to be successful? Go down the line on that one. What would you tell Dr. Collins? What have you told Dr. Collins? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jonathan. So, I, uh, the, the point I made earlier, I think it's is as this area has transitioned to, to impacting clinical care and not being purely about research, then a lot of the a lot of the expertise that needs to be applied to make this precision medicine initiative it doesn't reside in the NIH, it resides in the private sector. So it's critical that there is that strong public-private partnership link as part of this initiative. And it looks like that, you know, where that actually resides, the NIH, the ONC, is where that piece out. I guess what I would say to him is that we should study the past attempts to build these large coalition of data, see why they didn't work, see a big didn't very work very well for the National Cancer Institute. CTSA is working, but they're, they're, they're struggling a little bit. And then there's the National Children's Study that recently <coughs> kind of have some issues. And it's, I'm not sure of the status now, but we, we've tried this before. Uh, we should study what, what made those processes and those approaches not succeed and figure out the different approaches. So I actually came from the NIH, uh, the National Start 
still very much focused on what might be the experts. So there has to be a shift in paradigm in terms of how people start to make research process. Um, I'm actually thinking a step before that, which is if the million person cohort is going to work, we have to make sure we get that we're careful about making sure we recruit the right many patients. That we need to make sure that the million patients contain um, the right diversity of population, for example, um, and the, the right the right diversity of lots of other things as well. I mean, there's, there's ethnicity, there's geography, um, there's economic issues, there's environment issues. Um, we need some baselines. Um, ethnicity probably being the primary one, but making sure, you know, I think a lot of people are thinking about just crowdsourcing. That's going to skew the population. Um, and so thinking about how to recruit Thinking about patient engagement. There's the patient engagement again. How do we engage the patients and engage the entire community to, to be able to pull in the right groups? Uh, yeah, so from my perspective, to, to start with um, regulations that enable scalability and enable you know, data sharing and actually downstream to enforce these regulations, not just I hand it over to the researchers that sit in their you know their individual labs and you know handing off the, the work to the postdocs, but really think about how can we scale, how can we you know all grow together as you know um, to expand to share data and to really follow up on are these standards applied, are we following these regulations? Are we actually generating you know, data that's applicable to the learning that's, that's scalable beyond research to really bring um, the study back to the patient instead of just you know, as a target a research paper in the end? Our <coughs> target should shift more to developing better standards of care and do that at the you know, national or global level. Um, and actually, just building up that. Um, in marketing, when there's a critical mass of data, you don't actually have to have 100% representative samples, but if you get enough consumer data, you can build deals. Can that happen for genomics? Is a million people the right number where you have this critical mass where I'm sure it's not entirely accurate representation, but there's enough data there that you can make like 95% of more decisions? Is that realistic, or is it always the more better? I think, you know, when you get personalized medical choices, of course, it's different than individual choices, but can you kind of have this? master data set that can, that can guide most issues in the right direction? I think it depends on the million, and it depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you're going after diabetes or you're going after other chronic common diseases, a million might be enough. If you're going after certain organ diseases, you may miss them. So you have to decide what your targets are. There's a strength of the association. Any last part of you? We'll do uh, uh, me first or? No. Who first? You first? You, you first. You, you first. Like first. Go first? <laughs> oh, please. Go <laughs> first. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Steve. Okay. Uh, my, my question is this. I, um, there, there aren't really that many, um, at present, there's not that much in the gene. I mean, you were talking about doing these ex full exome screens. And, I mean, that just seems, why should society pay for that? We don't, there's no reason there isn't useful. But, I mean, at some point, maybe it will be. Maybe, but when? I mean, you don't know when, right? So um, I guess I'm just curious what the stress on putting, making this uh, part of a, uh, I mean, if, if you have this CYP, one of these uh, variants that's relevant, an older person and you're going to be put on Plavix, sure, you want that in the medical record. And I'm sure there's 20 other things. And, and if you're certain rare diseases where the screens have been useful. But overall, I, I guess it just seems like you're mixing clinical and re I mean, these are research, still really fundamentally research questions. So why, why the stress on 
to the clinical um, element that seems premature. I mean, not that you shouldn't answer these questions or eventually, but you're not talking about the million. I'm going to answer in the other direction. We're actually doing whole genomes. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing exomes. We're doing exomes for clinical care now, and we're moving toward genomes. And the reason is that we don't really know <coughs> which panel. First of all, it's not that much more expensive to do an exome than a panel. Okay. And the risk is that if you don't have that other information, um, you may be you may be depending on, um, for example, a variant in a gene that isn't being expressed. Okay. Um, that, that there are things that we may not know, and this goes back to the FDA thing. <coughs> we may not yet have full statistical analysis of this variant or that in the exome that's not in the panel. But you could look at a variant, know it's, you've not seen this in anything but this disease before, and biologically you can understand what the process would be that would cause this variant you can work out a plausible to do this. Idea. Now, if the patient's not dying, maybe you don't go with that risk, okay? But if you've got a patient in, in, in critical condition, right, looking at something that looks like the more probable cause, um, in, especially in things like cancer, matters. You get more information. Um, and, and, yeah, I mean, we're, we're actually at this point essentially doing a research study that's comparing whole genomes to foundation medicines cancer, okay? Um, just because every cancer patient gets foundation medicines, medicines cancer panel done now, and we're doing a research study that's doing whole genomes, so we have both answers, okay? It actually didn't start out as a research project to do that, okay? But it's turned out as a side effect of the research project we're doing. We get that information. You're comparing the utility of foundation um, medicine. No, well, with a full team. what I'm saying is, what, we have a project going on that's looking at the utility of whole genome. Okay, actually, whole genome and RNA together. Okay, what we're seeing is that if we look at the foundation medicine panel, we don't always see the same results. Okay. I don't have the information yet that says we beat them, okay? I don't have any information that says we beat them. I have information that says we would choose different drugs, okay? Or maybe we'll just, because we don't know, compare, try both together. Um, it's a research study, okay? But there are things that, that you can find and, and you know, there's anecdotes all over the literature, and it's nothing statistically proven. But you see these anecdotes where patients were saved because they did sequencing at the last minute and found something that wasn't supposed to be in that disease. Or and because had they drug got peach pits. What? Excuse me. Or because they got peach pits in Tijuana. I mean, I just wonder about. Okay, the, so the, so you know, there's the famous story about the the. Um, scientist at Washington University Medical School who had leukemia. Um, this is a published paper. I don't know all the details because it's a published paper. I read the paper. I don't know the people. Um, he, had, he had relapsed. He had weeks to live. Every known treatment hadn't worked. And they sequenced him. I happen to know they didn't sequence him in a clinical lab, but nobody's supposed to know that. It doesn't say it in the paper. Okay. Um, but, you know, this guy had two weeks to live. What were you going to do? And they found a variant, not in one of the standard panels you would have done for leukemia. They found a variant. It was an off-label drug that had a chance. They treated him with it. It's five years later, and the guy's working at the Wash U Genomics Center. Okay? He has not relapsed. He's in long-term remission, and he had weeks to live. Okay? Those things happen. Okay? There's, there's a... 
story about a dying kid at the University of Wisconsin that was also published, okay, where all they had to do was change his diet, okay, but they changed his diet based on a whole genome sequence that wouldn't have showed anything in a panel. And so you're right, we're mixing clinical and research, and the question is, what's the difference in cost? And how many lives do you save in the meantime? And what are the risks you introduce? Because I'm sure there are. And, and we're all in the middle of this. Um, when I was at the Broad Institute, I was told by a doctor at one of the major New York, uh, Massachusetts hospitals that a mitochondrial panel for a sick kid, an undiagnosed sick kid, cost $18,000 and insurance paid for it. I can do a whole genome for $2,000. And guess what? I can find all the mitochondrial genes in the whole genome. So you got your $18,000 and all the rest of it for free. Um, so we're in a very weird situation right now where, you know, when you're dealing with life critical situations, it's not clear. But no, I don't know what the cost of the panel is versus the cost of the exome or the cost of the whole genome. Um, but, but the costs are coming down so rapidly that it's not clear. It's not clear that panels are cheaper. It's just clear that insurance companies will reimburse you for them. So maybe you just do them because they'll get reimbursed. Okay. I'm sorry. I went back again. Then Steve, and then I. Can I just ask yeah. that real quick? When you have your exome in your hand, right? The algorithms for variant columns change all the time, right? So a variant that wasn't called when you were originally sequenced could be called later with new discoveries and new algorithms that you've developed, right? So you can actually just later on that you wouldn't have before. So having that data available and being able to analyze it is, is very valuable. I just wonder about all the different knowledge, and there's the genome, and then there's the RNA, and there's this, and there's a, and then just there's an infinite number of things that we can be testing for, and yeah, the gut biome, and right, proteome, and I don't know, but, um, before you have specific knowledge. And most, and most of that is still in the research domain. But some of it goes to the clinical domain, at least when things get critical. Final question. I can't remember What I was going to say is, most of this panel up until that, by the way, was about all the issues of privacy and cost and medical ethics and who gets this. And sooner or later, all that's going to get something. And we're going to get flooded with more data than anybody else can do with. And we don't have the infrastructure to handle it. Anyway, you have 6,000. What if you had 3 million? What would happen to your operation? It would stop. So to me, we need to be working on that. Type of thing. Someone needs to be investing in technology to make this stuff work. And I don't know who that is right now. I mean, you know, I know at Oracle we do a whole bunch of stuff, but I don't, I don't know who in this, this personalized medicine initiative is going to be the group that's actually going to invest in platforms. You want, my, you want my answer? You know, I, I sort of do and sort of don't. Okay, I'll shut up. No, I would love your answer. This is, let's this let's do a lightning round. How about that? Let's do a lightning round response. Okay. You know, go down um, the, panel. One minute. the reality is that the, the, um, the very large data um, is the whole genome, and that's the thing that's 150 gig, or for cancer could be 500 gigabytes for one patient. But the variant data that you pull out of that is one hundredth of that size. And right now we can't get rid of the raw data because our analysis isn't good enough that we can trust that we've gotten all the variant information out of the raw data. And the analysis has to improve. And once the analysis improves enough, we'll get rid of all that raw data and that problem will go down by at least a hundredfold. That makes me nervous. It makes everybody nervous. Well, a hundredfold may not be enough. No, I, 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 I get, I'm yeah. nervous about the raw data. Yeah, that's, Everybody's that's, nervous about it. I think we have to find better ways to yeah. compress the raw data. data. To, you can, to keep it. Most of it you can sequence again. For cancer, you can't necessarily sequence again. Microbiomes, you can't sequence again. Everything else you can sequence again. The DNA is cheaper storage. Right, but when the next generation sequences, that was the biggest conversation, right? And we ended up keeping it. 
Did you really? Only, yeah, for, only, for, only for a year. Samples, no. a unique sample, we kept right? all of the image data. We kept all of the image data for a year or two. Then we got rid of the image data and said the intensity data will be good enough. So you're gonna and so quite frankly, betting on less data is the opposite of the world. Right? <laughs> Yeah, but you're going to get more data, not less data, no matter what. We have to find a way to stay with you. But, right, I mean, okay, it's health. Technology is changing, right? We are, you know, we're investing in an exascale type. We, we haven't talked about that, right? The compute, right? We want to do this all, all in a day by 2020. We have to enable that compute, that high performance compute yes. that's needed to be yes. able to do that, right? So, exascale computing, right? Intel is very much committed to that, doing that, talking about scalable data. Like how do you store your CF files, right, and do it in database right, right. computation? But there's, it's more complicated than that. There's network speeds, there's transportation Bandwidth, data. Bandwidth, yes. I mean, it's one thing having everything in one place and being able to act on it. It's another thing, him trying to access Google Linux terabytes. Of data. So I just wonder in this $215 million, who's going to be the one that's going to step up and start doing that? Because it is fast. It is, if you want to get someone in aid, Provide care based on some gene mapping, it's a massive undertaking. You do have to physically nail a hard drive, that's the most economic need for a I mean, right now, I mean, that's the state of the art, it's physically nail a hard drive. So, that infrastructure problem <coughs> is. I agree with, with the bandwidth issues, right? And, and in terms of our solutions, in, in terms of trying to enable better rated computing, right? So that the, the data stays at the local institution, yes, the bandwidth is, is going to be an issue in the connected. The point that was made earlier actually is true, I think, in that we, 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 we focused on genomics now because we actually got pretty good at it. So we, we figured out the technology over the last few years and we, we do it well. So that's where we're putting all our focus and it's going to have an impact for sure. But it is the, the first focus, right? And I think Toby's right. Proteo, which is metabolomics, they're not, they're not here yet, they're not mainstream, you can't go into production with them. You can't even be sure that you can identify the protein correctly in a lot of cases. But we will figure it out. So that cloud of data is just going to keep growing. We may shrink yeah. genomics because we understand Right, that, but, but you're right. The rest of it will, and the proteomics data right now is bigger than the genomics data. It's right. just that there isn't all, as much of it. So um, like someone's <laughs> But it's happening. Another issue, another issue that touches on is, is as, as the research community becomes a little more, more networked, all these countries have rules about how data can flow across borders. Even we see that in the United States, specific local vision permits for states about how data can be processed and how it can be managed. You can have a million people in the United States, but if you have a million people in the US and Canada and the UK and Germany all sharing all sharing this genetic information, you know, it's a network effect. Your your research comes out much more uh yeah. infrastructure problems. Yeah. You see a lot of these high power. We did it for EHRs, and if we're saying this is a priority, well, okay, so, uh, sorry, we created an incentive program for a platform, but, but, but I guess what I'm saying is if there's technology that wraps around this precision medicine initiative, we ought to be upfront about it. We ought to say this is how much it's going to cost, and we ought to fund it. just so they can share data internally. You can't do that in every hospital. Um, you can. Well, you can. I love that. It's just a lot of money. Right, yeah. exactly. It's all doable. Yeah. 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 There's also the, uh, the internet, too, which is up to speed to 400 uh, megabits per second. That's one thing. As far as computing is concerned, that we can go to a massive <coughs> uh, machine. So you can divide and conquer. And instead of just looking at the whole sequence all by itself, you, you can terrorize it. And, and well, it's, it's a little trickier than that. 
a little tricky. Yeah, you paralyze and you don't get the same answer at the end. But yes, mm -hmm. I agree. Right, right. I think they're going to give us the book if we keep staying in yeah. this room here. Okay. I, I want to thank our panelists. They're national experts.